So today we are continuing with our series on spiritual warfare and that we are in a battle. And I'm going to get really deep theologically right now, okay? I want, I want you guys to pay attention, all right? We're going to get really, really deep. You guys ready? You guys, you guys good for that? Okay, really, really deep. Okay, that's called Luke Skywalker. And, and also his mentor, Obi-Wan Kenobi. A lightsaber. This is a weapon for a Jedi Knight, not a clumsy random as a blaster. An elegant weapon for the more civilized age. <laughs> okay. All right. That's cool. Okay. I had to play with some toys today. But anyhow, you can put the lights back on. This represents the lightsaber. And what's interesting, if you're not a Star Wars fan, it's okay. We'll, we'll forgive you the next service. But we actually, what they teach in that... And that's in that in that fictitious story, what they teach basically is the Jedi Knight is the one that uses the sword, and you really don't have much power until you become a Jedi and learn to be led by the Force with the lightsaber. So Luke would put a shield on, and he would feel and be led by the Spirit, uh, the Holy the Holy Spirit. The force, and he'd be able to fight against the enemy. And a Jedi has to be well trained, and all the other weapons, blasters and all that, don't do much. It's the lightsaber that can stop sh ships from firing at you, can go through walls. It's a very powerful weapon and an arsenal of the Jedi Knight. Now, conversely, we also have a very powerful weapon that we have. It's my son's expensive lightsaber, so I have to put it away. Okay, he said, Dad, don't break it. We also have something else. We have the sword of the Spirit. I'm having fun today. We have the sword of the Spirit, and this, the Bible talks about the sword. It's an offensive weapon. You see, all of us, a lot of us try to live our lives trying not to do stuff, right? Come to church and find out what you can't do. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do this. You can't do that. You stop sinning. Stop sinning, for God's sake. Literally, for God's sake. Stop sinning. And so we did. But actually, do you realize the sword of the Spirit is an offensive and defensive weapon? The only way you win in sports and in war is you have to take ground. You have to use the sword in order to win. This is kind of fun. Okay. So today we're going to talk about that and look into what the Bible has to say about the sword of the Spirit. Are you guys ready? All right, spiritual warfare is real. You're in a battle, like it or not. You're in a battle. And so as soon as we understand that, we don't just fight against flesh and blood. We're going to get into the scriptures real quick. You guys ready to go? All right, let's look into it right now. Finally, be strong, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, the Bible says, right? That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the enemy. How do we stand against the enemy? With the full armor. We don't pick and choose. We put it all on. The first three parts of the armor you put on. The last three you use as necessary. Okay? So we put on the armor of God against the schemes of the enemy. We fight against the flesh, the world, and the devil. That's the battlefield. And primarily the battlefield is in your mind. And so how we think and what we allow in our lives is absolutely key. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil and the heavenly places. Therefore, take up what? The whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, because we have evil days, and having done all to stand, what do you got to do? Sometimes all you got to do is to stand. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to give in to the, the situation. I'm going to stand on God's truth. Stand firm. Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth. The belt of truth. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And as shoes for your feet. Putting on the readiness of the gospel of peace. In all circumstances take up the shield of faith. In which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation. And... The sword... I'm going to have fun today. The sword of the Spirit, which you, it's a word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance. 
Okay, what does this all mean? Well, we talked about this. We talked about all this. The Apostle Paul was under house arrest. He's under arrest. He was chained to a Roman guard. And he wrote this, and he looked at the Roman guard probably and came up with illustrations. And so basically he said the breastplate, first thing is the belt of truth. Truth is very important. Truth holds it all together. We don't believe, we believe there is truth. And truth helps you to align the rest of your life, which is righteousness, right living, okay? We talked about the breastplate of righteousness. We talked about the shoes of peace. Very important to have cleats so you can run and, and do that. We also have the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and today is the sword of the spirit. And this is like basically a gladius, or actually a uh, makuro, if I said it correctly. It is a, a, a shorter sword. There's a longer one, but this is for hand-to-hand -hand combat. This is when the enemy gets up on your grill. This is hand to hand combat. So you can fight and you can jab and you and very, very, it was very, very, um, very, very sharp. In fact, uh, they did archaeological digs and they found, um, this is what they would do, this is what they found. These are like 2,000 year old swords they found. And this is a major weapon. It was two edge. It could cut both ways. And so you'd have it on your, on your, um, on your belt of truth and you'd pull it out and the enemy come, you would jab them like this and twist it, and all of a sudden the entails would come out. Why are you so, I'm just telling you what would happen. So the apostle Paul's not messing around, right? He's talking about take the sword of the spirit. that You can jab, and you can slice, and you can dice. Because we are fighting, I'm enjoying myself too much. I understand that, okay? Just relax, everybody, okay? I'll put it down, okay? I don't want to hurt anybody, all right. But the sword of the spirit, what is the sword? The sword of the Spirit is the only offensive weapon in the arsenal. It's the only offensive weapon in the arsenal. That's how you take charge. And so what's the sword of the Spirit? It's the Word of God. The sword is a dagger used for close combat. How many of you ever experienced before? You are, maybe it's three in the morning, you're, you're facing some anxiety or something. Or maybe it's after work and you're with your friends and, and all of a sudden you, you stop doing substances and they're doing substances and you're tired and you're weary. Or maybe your marriage is on the rocks and you're struggling and someone's coming to you and, and they're together and you have this desire to give in. Or maybe you're in a discussion with your spouse and you're about ready to say something really hurtful and you just almost can't contain yourself. Or maybe you're involved in a situation where you're with somebody and you know you're married, you shouldn't be involved with it. Maybe you're not married. Maybe you're involved with a business deal and you know it's wrong. You know you should tell the truth about it. But if you let go right now, you'll lose the deal. You won't get the promotion. And I gotta say it. Or maybe you're gonna lie in your entrance exam to get into the school you want. And there's that moment, it's almost like you can't stop yourself. And then you quote scripture and you still fall. I don't know if this ever happened to you. We're going to share a little secret, a little strategy I want to share with you at the end of today that we often don't take, a very important one that the Bible talks about. So the sword is a dagger used for close to, um, combat. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, which is the Word of God. And the Greek word there is rhema, which we're going to explain in a few moments. Rhema is the spoken word used in the right situation. Let me explain to you. The three Greek words for word is following. The first one is graphe. Graphe would be like this. I open my Bible, right? There's, there's ink on the pages and you can see it. It's right there. Some people treat the graphe. I, I, got, a, I got a Bible in my car. I come to church with the Bible. I got a Bible in the dashboard of my house. I got the Bible in my bedroom. Every child in my house has a Bible. We have a Bible everywhere. And people act like the graph is going to change your life, like a, like, almost like a, 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 a rabbit's lucky foot. I got a cross hanging in, on, my, on my mirror that's going to protect me. It's kind of superstitious. You see, this graph does not save you. Graph does not save you. This is just the words. There are people that, there are atheists that memorize this, like Karl Marx and others that memorize the Bible as a child. And it, it just does not, graphic does not save you. Graphic is important, right? You got to understand and read the graphic. It's the methodology to hear what the Word of God is. So that's the graphic. The second one would be Logos. It's the message of the writings. It says in John chapter 1, the Word was God. The word, became, the word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Logos. 
That's the word enacted and alive. When you read the Bible, what we want to be able to do, when you come to church today, what I'm doing is I'm taking the graphe off the page and I'm telling you the logos. It's rightly applied the word of God so you can hear the logos. In fact, in the very beginning in the book of Genesis, it says the spirit of God was hovering over the waters and then God said, he spoke, the logos was released. The rhema word was released and what creation began to happen when God spoke. So I like to look at it this way. Imagine, if you will, that God's word is one side of the blade and when I speak his word, it's the other side of the blade. It's a two-edged sword. God's word and my mouth are coming together. I'm taking the word of God and I'm not using as an abracadabra. I'm taking the rightly dividing the word of truth and using the word to cut away the enemy of my life and your life. And this is what we are able to do with this. So we have the graphe, logos, and here we have the rhema, that's the utterance. So you read the graphe. If you're not reading the graphe, you're not gonna get the logos. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord, right? So we have the rhema is a declaration of the logos that you get from the graphe. Now, let me explain to you what has happened to me and it's happened to you probably as well. If you read the Bible and you give your life to Jesus, I encourage you to read the Bible and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And while you're reading, sometimes things jump off the page and touch you. Specifically, I remember one time a number of years ago, it was 1997, uh, 96 actually, I was reading the Bible in Proverbs 20, 20. It says, he who curses his mother and father whose lamp will be put out in the utter darkness. And when I read that scripture verse, the Holy Spirit said, you have issues with your dad, and I'm gonna send you back to Connecticut to work with him. <laughs> and I was in Colorado. And I had to work out the issues with my father. What were my issues with my father? It wasn't his issue, it was my issues. I had issues with required tissues, right? And so the issue was, I, I grew up in the church, and my dad did not defend himself very much. And I could not stand how he would lay down and let people walk over him, so I thought at the time. And so even to this day, sometimes I gotta be careful because I, I like to defend, I like to fight. Don't worry. But I, you know, I don't like to just to lay down and say, okay, go ahead. No, I wanna fight for our rights to worship the Lord. And so I, and I recognized I had the wrong attitude, so I asked God to forgive me, and then God's like, I'm sending you home. And so I worked here for a couple of years, met my wife, Sandra, boop, and thank God I went home and just stayed in Colorado, right? Even though Colorado's pretty amazing. Okay, that's beside the point. So the rhema word spoke to me, and what happened is it cut me. It cut me open. And it was like a, it was like a scalpel. I cut out an area of my life by the word of God, something that was infecting my spirit and not allowing me to experience the fullness of a God. In fact, I will tell you that all through my life, I, every day I get in the word of God, it's like he's cutting away the fat, cutting away the bad things in my life to hold me back. See, rhema is the spoken word. Word of God. And this is what the Bible says about Scripture. Here in uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture, and by the way, that's graphe. All graphe, the scrolls, right? All 66 books of the Bible. And when Timothy, when Apostle Paul wrote this, by the way, this was uh, about 70, 60 A.D., even the Apostle Peter calls Paul's writing Scripture. So we had Scripture very early. And the canon of scripture you have, the New Testament, was well received and well received in that time. So all scripture, including the Old Testament, is breathed out by God and is profitable teaching for reproof, for correction, and for training and righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every work. When I look into the word of God, what I see is I look into a mirror. And I see what I'm supposed to look, I can make adjustments, right? Another part of the scripture says this in Hebrews 4, 12. For the word of God, for the logos of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You really want to change your life, get into the thoughts and the intentions of your heart. Now, we've showed this diagram before. I'm going to show it again to help explain how this works. Okay, we're, I believe we're triune beings, and I think you can make a case for it. You have the body, you have the soul, and you have the spirit. The body is obvious, the outside. Then you have the soul, which includes the mind, the will, and emotions. Some of you function out of your mind a lot. If it may, it's got to make sense. 
Some of you function out of the will. I'm gonna do it no matter what. I, I, I'll never forget that person. Some of you function out of the emotions and blame the Holy Spirit for your emotions. The Holy Spirit will speak through your emotions, or speak through your will, speak through your mind. Does that make sense? So what we do is, when I read the Word of God, what I'm seeing, if I say, I, I need to forget that person. I need, to, I need to forget that person that came against me. They hurt me, they bothered me, they said bad things about me, and all of a sudden I began to realize this, this pastor that I used to work for said some hurtful things to me, and I realized I had an issue with him 20 years later. So I had to take out the, the, I had to take out the sword, and I had to cut away the lies. I had to thrust it and turn it. And what happened is I cut away the fat, the blockages, and more of the Spirit came out. And more freedom came to my life. So what we want to do is almost like it, it can be a scalpel where you're, you're letting the Holy Spirit cut away the fat of your life, right? Like a good butcher. Also, it's like a scalpel to cut away the cancer of your life, the things that are growing that have no business in your life. Bitterness, anger, resentment. Right? And you take that and you use it to cut away. So this is what we want to do all the time. That's why I get into the Word. The Word of God shows me something. Okay, God, I can tell right now that my thought process is not right about this situation. You know, God, you, you put the government over us. I'm supposed to pray for those in authority over me, not make fun of them, say derogatory comments about them. As I, the other night, I was watching something on television. There was a State of the Union, and somebody I was with was starting to make fun of the president. Said, Stop it. That's our president. We have to pray for him. You may not like them. The Bible says pray for those in authority over you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to honor God. Okay? Does that make sense? No. You know, we got to be different than the world. Is that clear? Right? We're to pray for those in authority. Now, we can still vote them out of office. But we got to pray for those in authority. That's, that's the word of God. So even though I want to speak my mind on something, even though I want to talk about somebody, you know what they did to me. The Bible says do not gossip. And everyone's around, and, and they, people have been talking about you. This person's been dragging you down, right? And all of a sudden, you man, I got an opportunity to give back. Nope, I'm not going to gossip in Jesus' name. And what you do, you see that little terrorist of gossip, and you and you don't negotiate with terrorists. When the enemy comes in, what we got to do is kill him. Take every thought captive and make it obedient. You just take it, you slay that thought. Don't even put up with it, guys. Don't put up with it. We're going to see, you're going to see what I'm talking about. That's kind of violent, Pastor. Well, I'm not talking about literally swords in the, in the real world. I'm talking about in your mind, how we do that. Sounds good, doesn't it? Okay, here we go. So, Jesus experienced this in the wilderness. I want to show you how Jesus dealt with it. Listen, if Jesus dealt with it this way, do you think maybe we need to do the same? Okay, what did Jesus do? After he was baptized, he went into the wilderness for 40 days. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was what? Is there anything wrong with being hungry? No. Right? He was hungry. Is there anything wrong with wanting to be liked by people? Not necessarily. Is there anything wrong with wanting to be confident and have purpose in your life? No. But what the enemy does, he takes legitimate longings and desires and twists them. He twists them. For example, is there anything wrong with, with, with sexuality in the, in the context of marriage? No. But sometimes what the enemy tries to do is take your sexuality, right desire, wrong season, and uses it out of its right season to hurt you and hurt other you know, people. So, Jesus was led by the Spirit. For 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry, had a right desire, okay? So he's in the wilderness. It's not Jesus, by the way. I just thought it was a good picture. Okay. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, the enemy always goes after your identity. He always goes after questioning if you are the Son of God. Turn these stones into bread. Now, is there anything wrong with Jesus turning stones into bread? What's wrong with that? You know, after all, I've been here for 40 days. I've fasted for 40 days. I've done this for 40 days. And then, you know what? I am the Son of God, and the bread's right here. Why not? There's nothing wrong with it. Hey, hey, it's okay just to view a little bit on the internet. I'm not doing anything wrong. It's okay to kind of, you know, I know I, know I shouldn't be looking at these people and get jealous about them, but I can't believe they went on that vacation. 
How do they, how do they marry that person? Why are their kids doing so well in school? How, how come their church is growing in minds now? How come they have hair and I don't? <laughs> right? So you start looking, you start comparing yourself. Oh, that's not right. That's not right. And what are you doing? You're giving into temptation. Right? So what should you do? Lord, thank you for that other church that's doing well, even though they're hypocrites. <laughs> Right, right. Lord, thank you that that woman, I, I know, Lord, I, <clears throat> I'm not going to say anything, but anyhow, you know what I'm saying, everybody. You look like, you guys, don't you love social media? It just shows you everything you're not, right? And everyone's perfect, and we can't stand perfect people, right? My, my child's on the honor roll, and you want to put a bumper sticker saying, my son beat up your son on the honor roll. So the temper came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. What did Jesus say? But he answered him, you know, Satan, you're right. I'm the son of God, and I have a right to do what I'm... No, he didn't do that. What did he do? Did he negotiate? Did he talk? What did Jesus do? It is what? It is written. It is, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, rhema, that comes from the mouth of God. Boom! Takes it and twists it on the enemy. And by the way, he's quoting Deuteronomy 8.3. So man does not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from God. I'm not going to listen to you, enemy. I'm going to live on the word of God. I don't live for food. I live for the food to do the will of my Father, which he told his disciples later on. It's more important that I serve God. And he takes that knife, he takes that sword, and he cuts, and he uses it, and he pulls it away. Doesn't negotiate. Do not negotiate with terrorists. Anyone that negotiate with a terrorist is a fool. You do not negotiate with the terrorists. You take their heads off. Don't worry, I'm not going to throw it at you. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, the enemy always goes after your identity. If he can get you to believe something about your identity that's incorrect, he's got you. Why is it the enemy is going after the identity of young people today? Why is the enemy going after the identity where we don't even know what we are anymore? Because if he can get you to believe a lie, he's got you. So what you can say is, I am a son of God. I'm a strong man of God. And you pull that out and you take the sword of the Spirit and you tell who you are in Christ. I'm forgiven. I'm redeemed. Right? So the devil took him and said, if you are the son of God. Throw yourself down, for it is written. Now Satan quotes scripture. By the way, Satan knows scripture a lot better than you. And there are people that twist scripture to say all sorts of things. I see churches around the area saying, God still speaks. It sounds wonderful until you find out what's happening. They're changing the Bible. They're actually changing the Bible, taking things out of the Bible. And what does the word of God say? If anyone preaches a different gospel, that will be preached to you, even an angel from heaven, or myself, the Apostle Paul says, let him be accursed. Whoop. That's not the gospel of Christ. Now, we do it to the thoughts, not the person. Does that, make, does that make sense? So you pull it out, right? And so if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it's written, he will command his angels concerning you. And by the way, the enemy is quoting Psalm 91. We love Psalm 91. And on their hands they will bear up you up, lest you strike your foot, against a stone, Jesus said to him. You know, you're right. Satan, that would, that might work. You know, I, after, I'm gonna do some miracles. I'm gonna, I'm gonna raise the dead. I'm gonna open blind eyes. That might be a, an interesting thing to do. Maybe I could jump off the pinnacle of the temple. And by the way, we can get the lust of life, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, and, 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 and riches, the three things that Jesus struggled with. Almost every temptation are those three things. I call them the three G's. Gold, gold, girls, guys, and, and uh, greed. Those are the three things that get us, right? So on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Takes that knife, does not negotiate, does not say, well, it might be okay to do No, it's not okay to do that. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to falsify those records. I, I know I'm irritated with this person right now, but uh, the word of God said I must forgive. So, Lord God, I forgive this person right now. Someone's talking bad about somebody. Lord, I forgive. I'm not going to give into it right now. You take that knife out, take that sword, and you do a combat. combat. You stab it, you stab it, you stab it. You, stab, you continue to stab it until it's dead. 
take the word of God and constantly, now I'm talking about your own mind. Is that clear, everybody? We're not gonna go out of here and buy a bunch of swords and run into the town hall. Is that clear with tiki torches? All right, is that, is that clear? Okay, thank you. All right, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the earth, all the fame, right? And their glory and said to them, all these I will give you if you'll fall down and worship me. It always puzzled me. Why? Well, the enemy does have jurisdiction for now. Ultimately, he's under God's authority. But this was a shortcut to achieve something. And so I'm not going to break down these three temptations except for the fact that Jesus pulled out the sword. And what did he do? What did he do? Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall not, you should worship the Lord your God, and in him only shall you serve. He takes the knife and he twists it. Guess where he's reading from? He's quoting Deuteronomy 6, 8. He's meditating on a passage of scripture. The entire uh, situation in the book of Matthew, he is quoting between Deuteronomy 6 through the 8th chapter. He's meditating on the word. He's got graphe in him. If the word, how to use the graphe to get the logos, to take the rhema, to beat the enemy, how much more do you and I have to take the word, take the graphe, take the logos, take the rhema, and kill the enemy? Do you see that, everybody? If Jesus found it necessary, how much more should you and I find it necessary? And this is what the enemy did. Now, when Jesus is tempted, he speaks scripture. What did he do? It is written, it is written, it is written. When the Pharisees and Sadducees came, confronted him. Is it right for a man? Should a man give to God or Caesar? And, and, or how about this? Is it permissible for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? It is written. He say, he quotes scripture. He doesn't negotiate. He doesn't talk. He says, it says, it is written, it is written, it is written. So he takes it out and he says, it is written. And they have nothing else they can say. And also when he's on the, when he's on the cross in agony, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting Psalm 20. Two. into your hands I commit my spirit he's quoting the Psalms so when he's tempted he speaks scripture when he's confronted he speaks scripture when he's in agony well how about you and I how about when you and I when we're tempted what are we going to quote I can't help myself I, 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 don't, I can't help myself no <laughs> I, 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 no it's not true what does the word of God say and, and 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken me what is common to man. God is faithful. He will not allow me to be tempted more than I may, but with every temptation, he'll provide an avenue of escape that I be able to stand under it. You're no good. You're not, no, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You're all alone. No, Jesus says, I will never leave you or forsake you to the end of the age. And, and for the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross. I know heaven's in front of me, and I can do all things. I don't fight for victory. I fight from victory. Get that sword. Know the sword. Get the graphe in you. Get the graphe. Let the graphe become the logos in your heart. And then when it's time, take out the rhema and slice and dice the enemy of your life and move forward in Christ. That's what we got to do. Now, you read the graphe. So you can, okay, you read the graphe, all right? Get into the word so you can understand the logos. That's not just words. Now it's, 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 it's actually living. Right now I'm, I'm sharing the living word. So now you read the graphe, you get the logos in you, and then you can use then the rhema of the word, the right thing, and use that sword of the rhema at the right place in the right time. Now, I wanted to bring a, another illustration in the Old Testament that talks about what you and I face. You heard of Joseph in the Old Testament. Okay, he basically, he was in, his brother sold him to slavery. He rose up and got into Potiphar's house. Potiphar was the captain of the guard, very wealthy man. Joseph and Potiphar's wife, I call her Hotifer. She's Hotifer, okay? Apparently, she's a very beautiful woman. He was a very handsome man like your pastor, okay? So anyhow, so very well built. <clears throat> So anyhow, he's going around, and she basically says, hey, 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 husband's gone, no one's home, why don't we get together? And what does he say? He refused. He goes, behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house. And he's put everything that he has in my charge. Now, now 
Watch what happens. Joseph quotes scripture that he knew. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? The scripture he understood through the oral tradition. Well, he takes the sword out and he cuts it. And he moves on. Right? He didn't negotiate with her. We know Potiphar, Potiphar excuse me. <coughs> I'm Potiphar's wife. I know you're Potiphar. Oh, okay. He didn't negotiate with her. And I, we shouldn't be doing this. We shouldn't be doing I know your husband's kind of a jerk. And oh, let me pray. Let me pray for your marriage. Well, would you pray for my marriage? I'll pray. Guys, that is a trick. Don't pray for someone. If you're married to somebody, if you're married to your wife or your husband, and you have another person, pray for me. I'll pray for your marriage. Don't do that. Don't do that. Oh, you know, I find you kind of attractive. I, I know we shouldn't. Don't tell someone you find them attractive. Big deal. Big deal you find them attractive. Don't say that. Don't negotiate. What did Joseph do, right? He didn't negotiate. Now, by the way, she kept pestering him day in, day out, day in. What happened next? She caught him by the garment saying, lie with me. But he, but he said, okay, we can't do this. It's so wrong. Oh, if it's so wrong, why does it feel so right? It must be okay. God wants me happy. I, I've been in slavery all this time. I've been in prison. I, I've ex I'm not in prison yet. I've been in... I, 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 God wants me happy. You're not happy, so let's go ahead. God will understand. His grace will forgive me. No, what does he do? Lie with me. But he left his garments in her hand, and he what? He fled. Now, why did he flee? Because he wanted to sleep with her. He was tempted to sleep with Potiphar. He was. No, it's Potiphar. Potiphar's wife. He was tempted. Sometimes you come to a situation where the heat is so great, God is providing you an avenue of escape. It's not time to talk about it. It's not time to even quote scripture. Sometimes you gotta drop your sword and run out of there immediately. When you're in a situation, you're married or whatever, and you and your spouse are getting in a nice conversation, and you wanna say something that's gonna hurt her, best thing to do is run out of the house. Maybe you're in a situation situation after work and people are drinking you just got free for it. maybe people are snorting maybe they're smoking I don't know maybe there's a girl at work and everyone left the bar and it's just you and her and and, and, and you're like wow this is incredible and you're like oh, no what do you do yeah run out of there do not give the enemy a chance it's sometimes the worst thing you can do is quote scripture sometimes the best thing to do is run run retreat get out of there well how can you say that that's the old testament no it's not let me show you the New Testament. Apostle Paul, so flee youthful lust. Don't negotiate with sin. Sometimes the enemy say, well, why don't you quote, quote scripture about it? No, I'm not going to quote scripture. I'm, I'm out of here. Do you follow me, everybody? Because what happens is the limpics part of your brain, the emotional part of your brain, the enemy knows that, and your cognitive area shuts off. Best thing for you to do is get out, let your brain relax, Give your mind back to God and get the cognitive back in there again. Let the Holy Spirit come in then and calm yourself down. Take the word and get yourself right. Then you can deal with the situation. Sometimes the best thing you can do is run. So, I believe that's for someone today. Because sometimes you can't seem to break free your temptation. And God would say to you, run. Get your, get your composure and get help. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that you're an amazing God. Lord, I ask that you would bless us today, Father, as we've been confronted with sin. We thank you for the word of the Spirit, the sword of the Spirit. Lord, I ask in Jesus' name that we would get into the graphe, that, Lord, that we'd read the word. Father, that we'd let your logos come inside, that we'd hide the logos in our heart. And, Father, that we'd be released in the rhema of the sword of the Spirit to defeat the enemies of our minds and that we would release your spirit for more freedom in Jesus' name.